Good morning. Thank you for coming to our panel today, which is part of the Five Years Out programs with, uh, sponsored by the NCA Vice President. Um, this panel is based on a forthcoming book called The Handbook on Rhetoric and Public Address. So all of these chapters have um, been finalized and are already off to press. So we're very excited to uh, feature the, uh, the, the chapters today. We're going to go a little bit uh, out of order and going to start with Kara Finnegan from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and she's going to talk about studying visual modes of public address. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here at 8 a.m. It's lovely. Uh, in my handbook chapter, I lay out a perspective on the study of visual modes of public address that's grounded in several assumptions. That visual modes of public address shape our experience of public life, that they have just as much capacity to be deliberative as talk and text, and that they are just as much a part of our rhetorical histories as oral and written modes. After decades of increased attention to visual rhetoric, it's nice to be able to begin with these assumptions instead of having what a lot of us used to have to have, which I refer to as the paragraph, which explains all of these things at the beginning of every essay. I now tell people to cut those paragraphs out, and I'm very pleased to be able to do that. But I think a few tasks remain if the study of visual modes of public address is going to mature in ways that, uh, at least I think, would be fruitful. And so uh, one of those tasks is, I think, to clarify the variety of potential approaches methodologically to the study of visual modes. And uh, while what I'm going to present today uh, might seem schematic or categorical, please, please, please do not interpret it that way. Um, no single study needs to employ all of the approaches I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but taken together, I think they outline uh, uh, a way to approach images that recognizes both their specificity as rhetorical documents and their fluidity as circulating objects in public culture. A second uh, important task is that of recovering visual histories of American public address. And we all know that rhetorics of our past were not just read and heard, they were also seen and consumed in many forms. They deserve to be recovered and seen again. While a few public address scholars have concentrated their work on visual history, countless artifacts are yet to be explored and countless dissertations, articles, and books are yet to be written. And I think often visual rhetoric has a kind of presentism associated with it. And I think a lot of that work is really great and important and exciting. But I want to make a call for the historically minded to think about visual rhetorical history as well. So how do we conduct what I think is this vital work and construct these histories? In the essay, uh, in the volume that Sean mentioned, I suggest that five approaches uh, enable us to explore visual modes of public address in useful ways. And that's the study of production, composition, reproduction, circulation, and reception. Taken together, these constitute what we might call a critical perspective in the visual sense on the study of visual modes of public address. When we attend to production, we examine where images come from and why they appear in the spaces where we find them. In studying production, we examine not only the technical aspects of image making, but also the generic institutional and authorial factors that influence the creation of images. Compositional analysis involves a description and interpretation of what we might call the visual grammar of images. Just as the close reader of texts benefits from having at her command a lexicon for interpretation, familiarity with tropes, figures, argument strategies mobilized in the text, or recognitions of allusions and, and references in the text, so too the visual critic needs some specific analytical tools. And these tools enable us to get at both the content and the form, which work together to create the potential for meanings in any given work. The study of reproduction invites the critic to examine what I call specific rhetorical events in which images appear. Critics investigating reproduction are interested in how visual images participate in messages created to address particular rhetorical problems. Uh, critics studying images and participation in contexts that include other images, as well as written text headlines or captions, their eventfulness as particular moments of discourse occurring in space and time. If the study of composition and reproduction help us discover the specificity of images' rhetorical work, then uh, next, the study of circulation helps us discover their fluidity. Uh, scholars theorizing circulation reject definitions that characterize circulation as simply the passive transmission of ideas, information, or images, and uh, argue instead that circulation does important cultural work, including creating interpretive communities and constituting publics. 
And Michael Warner has argued that circulation is, in fact, what constructs publics. Uh, as he famously said, a public is the social space created by the reflexive circulation of discourse. Because circulation, I think, is a key feature of visual culture, the critic of visual modes of public address uh, should be interested in examining where and how images move. Uh, the study of circulation, I think, cautions us against reifying any one interpretation of an image or an image reproduction and its accompanying rhetorical event. And then lastly, in the essay I talk about, uh, I suggest that the rhetorical critic may be interested in uh, exploring avenues for assessing audiences' responses to a work. Um, anytime we talk about rhetoric or public address, any reference to response uh, creates anxiety about effects and things like intentions. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but because, just because an image has the potential to produce particular effects or impact on an audience, of course, doesn't mean that it actually did or would. Uh, and so if we want to be able to say something uh, substantive about how actual audiences respond to images, we need to have some kind of way to talk about reception robustly. So I want to, just at this point, this is, that was a very loose sketch of these elements uh, that uh, I suggest make up a critical approach to images in the context of studying public address. And I want to, again, highlight a couple of things. One, uh, a study should never march through these. In fact, that would be probably unnecessary. I think the idea is really to think about what kinds of questions are leading you to images, what kinds of questions are images inviting you to ask of them in the particular context in which you find them? Uh, does the fact that you're seeing images everywhere suggest you're interested in their circulation? So these are uh, things you can do if you're interested in these various aspects. Um, what I want to do in the last uh, couple of minutes here is just talk briefly about three specific things that I would like to see uh, public address scholars recognize and attend to as we do the work of studying visual modes. And this is kind of in honor of this five years out theme uh, for the panel. And the first of these uh, might seem very traditional, and I mean that in a kind of almost art historical sense, but I think it's really important, and I find this working with my students. Uh, the importance of exploring the content of images in terms of visual topoi. Uh, the content of an image, of course, we could say is what an image shows or depicts, but what exactly do we mean when we say that? What exactly does any given image show or depict, and how do we talk about that? Uh, even if the image is representational, what the image's content is might not necessarily be obvious. Social, cultural, and historical knowledge will come into play, and uh, my colleague and co-editor of uh, the Visual Rhetoric book, Lester Olson, I think has shown this uh, best in his work, uh, that critics need to learn to recognize uh, the role of various commonplaces or topoi, especially in historical contexts. And so knowing what audiences would have been uh, assumed to recognize and be able to see in any given period is really important if you're going to get at what's going on in images that are uh, far away from us, you might say. Uh, Richard Lanham uh, uh, defines visual commonplaces as large libraries of images and icons. And so we can really think of uh, uh, visual topoi as the stock images of public culture. Uh, they're familiar to audiences, they're culturally ubiquitous, they're readily available, and they're recurrent across time and space. And some visual topoi, of course, become so culturally powerful that they consolidate into more dominant rhetorical forms. Depending upon your perspective, you might call these icons or ideographs. But other visual topoi might not be easily recognizable across time. Uh, for example, in his visual history of the American ideas of freedom and liberty, David Hackett Fisher, Fisher talks about the Liberty Pole. How many people in this room know what a Liberty Pole is or what it looks like? Okay, the early American <laughs> folks here and people who have taught early American public dress, right? Nobody knows. I can, my students have no idea what the Liberty Pole is, and most people uh, don't. But this is the Liberty Pole, uh, which, uh, think phallic here when I describe this, literally is a tall pole with a cap on top. And during the period of the Revolution, the Liberty Pole was a kind of material visual a symbol of freedom and liberty. People would erect them in the, the town squares. Uh, cities and towns had their own. Uh, they would decorate them in the holidays and, and uh, important uh, you know, moments. And so this object, this thing that would then circulate in images, would have been readily uh, recognizable to people uh, encountering them. Uh, but we may just have no access to this today. So recognizing, I think, the fact that we often don't recognize visual commonplaces is really important. And uh, in the Q&A, if people are interested, I can, I can give you some uh, specific 
literal places where you can go to start thinking about, um, you know, how do I get access to these uh, visual topoi? So that's the first thing, is uh, being aware of what we don't recognize uh, in terms of visual topoi. The second thing is I would really love to see scholars wrestle uh, better with issues of response and reception. Uh, there's lots of reasons why critics might study response in general, apart from visual modes. Uh, we might want uh, concrete evidence for claims about the impact of a work. Uh, we might want to, as Leah Ciccarelli has argued, check our interpretation of what we see going on in a particular rhetorical artifact with how others uh, who received it uh, interpreted it. Um, so Leah calls this close intertextual reading where we would uh, go in and essentially uh, verify in a, a, a relatively empirical way our interpretation and then look for places where those don't fit and think about why that might be the case. In addition, uh, studying reception enables the critic to look at other potential interpretations that might have been missed uh, at the risk of working at time and distance from a text, for example. You might miss some things. And then finally, the critic may be uh, as interested in the reception of a work as in the work itself. And this has been the case for me in some of the work that I've been doing most recently. Um, we white, uh, I'm really interested right now in thinking about reception as a way to uh, understand available or prevalent viewing practices in a particular time and place. Uh, some of the work that I've been doing in the context of viewership uh, uh, is, is interested in thinking about uh, response in a broader sense, almost in a way akin to this idea of commonplaces or visual topoi that I just talked about. So I think it, it can be really uh, powerful and interesting, I hope, to be able to construct a sense for ourselves of uh, the way that viewers would have interacted with and responded to particular images. So uh, having an understanding of visual topoi and how audiences would have engaged those at the time uh, the work was circulated is one way to do that. Another way to do that is to take up what Leah Ciccarelli uh, uh, also encourages us to do in terms of thinking about rhetoric and response, and that's to, uh, to uh, read texts produced by those who are responding. In other words, uh, to look at texts that, uh, or in some cases perhaps images, that give us a hint, uh, in some cases very direct uh, evidence of how people responded to images and uh, encourage us to think about what that not only tells us about the images but what that tells us about uh, the viewers themselves. So uh, that's what I'm really thinking about right now uh, and I'm trying to do this in order to understand what viewers understood in my case about photography in certain periods, um, what they understood photographs to be about and how they understood them as relating to their own matters of common concern. The last thing that I uh, would encourage all of you, especially those of you who don't care at all about studying visual modes of public address, but have come to this panel for many other excellent reasons, um, I would like to sort of make the claim uh, uh, that, it's, that visualizing public address is not just good for me, it's good for you, it's good for all of us. <laughs> and the reason is that it teaches us something not just about visuality, but about public address. Uh, knowing that there were objects, visual objects, and symbols and images created to represent, as Lester Olson has shown, uh, ideas and ideals of the American Revolution and uh, colonial life, transnational communication during that period, knowing that, I think, gives us a different perspective on rhetoric, on public address. And so it isn't just the people who like images who should be thinking about the role of visual modes of public address. I think it's all of us, because our studies of public address, I think, would be enriched more generally if we thought a little bit more about visuality. So the one way, to, the short way to put it would be, um, if you're not including thinking about visuality as a part of the context of whatever aspects of public address you're studying, why not? Uh, what would it give you uh, in terms of thinking about the context of the discourse or the figures you're studying uh, by, by thinking about that in addition to all the other things you're thinking about? So I'll just wrap up on that point. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. Next uh, is Bonnie Dow from Vanderbilt University. He's going to talk about feminism and public address. Hello. Um, my chapter 
on feminism and public address research begins with this sort of acknowledgement that people use the term feminism to mean several different things. We talk about it oftentimes as a topic for the rhetors that public address scholars study. We also talk about it as a theory, methodology, or critical perspective that informs the work of public address scholars. And then finally, and most foundationally, we use feminism to refer to a series of social and political movements you know, spanning the last few centuries that have had at different moments a variety of goals, but a consistent shared commitment to gender justice. So what I do in this chapter is discuss several overlapping threads in feminist public address scholarship that have emerged from those concerns over the past 25 years or so, including the recovery of women's in public address, which is a really interesting thing to talk about because this is now a kind of research in public address that has a real history. Secondly, I talk about the feminist critique of contemporary, increasingly mass-mediated political discourse, and I also talk about public address scholars' engagement with feminist and critical theories. The recovery project, we can, in some ways, we can date it in its most recent iteration to 1989 when Carlin Coors Campbell published Man Cannot Speak for Her, which was accompanied by Man Cannot Speak for Her, Volume 2, Key Texts of the Early Feminists. And in these two volumes, Campbell really set the standard for the recovery project in feminist public address. Not only did she provide well-researched and critically insightful analyses of the rhetorical power and historical significance of examples of feminist public address between 1832 and 1920, commonly referred to as the first wave of feminism, but she also dramatically increased the accessibility of rhetorical texts that other scholars might use as the basis for further work. So one of the things Karen and I have in common is acknowledging the ongoing need to continue to find either you know, visual rhetoric or, or visual history, in this case, um, and examples of feminist public address. If characterized as a specific brand of feminism, the political motives behind the recovery project would have most in common with liberal feminism in the sense that this type of scholarship is generally reformist in tone and purpose and seeks equality between men and women within existing structures. So it shares the assumptions of traditional public address studies that rhetorical excellence should be recognized, but it expands that tradition to include women rhetors. Until fairly recently, most of this work has taken an agent-centered and instrumentalist approach, focusing primarily on analysis of the achievement of individual rhetors in response to particular rhetorical context another characteristic that it shares with public address studies generally. Despite such similarities to traditional public address scholarship, feminist scholars working within the recovery project have also argued that understanding women's rhetoric requires rethinking traditional assumptions about what constitutes rhetorical excellence. So, for example, some have argued that the effects criterion is generally unsuitable for looking at women's rhetoric because of the formidable ob obstacles that they faced. They've also advocated rethinking traditional binaries between the public and the private spheres and the ways that that kind of division shapes our understanding of women's rhetorical activities. And scholars working within the recovery project generally agree that fully understanding women's public address requires the recognition that these rhetors face such tremendous obstacles and not least among them, the assumption that it was improper for women to speak in public at all. Determining the limits of the recovery project is difficult. Usually we use it to refer to scholarship that treats the intersections of feminism and public address from America's beginnings through the early 20th century, a span that we easily understand as historical that generally concludes around 1920 with the passage and the ratification of the 19th Amendment. But in fact, research into the second wave of U.S. feminism, now 30 plus years in the past, is also an important strain in feminism and public address, and it's the area in which I've most recently been working. Less coherent than the first wave, with its eventual central focus on gaining the vote for women, the second wave encompassed both liberal and radical groups and ideologies with contrasting goals of respectively changing discriminatory laws and challenging cultural sex role stereotypes and expectations. Carlin Campbell's 1973 essay, The Rhetoric of Women's Liberation, an Oxymoron, was the first influential treatment of radical second wave rhetoric among communication scholars. Her argument that women's liberation discourse was characterized by the strategy of consciousness raising has been profoundly influential. The amount of published work on the second wave has never approached the volume of work on the first wave, but in the last decade, feminist rhetorical scholars have also begun to turn their attention to the rhetoric of what has been called the third wave of feminism, which generally dates from the early 1990s. And third wave feminist scholarship is, is not, in fact, that coherent a body of work. This is still a kind of work that I think is really emerging but it sort of completes this three-part sense of what it means to study feminism as, as a thing or as, as feminist rhetoric as the product of feminist movements. 
So the recovery project, and I go on about the recovery project at some, at some length, but it's also been accompanied by other trends in the development of feminist approaches to public address. And part of that is because some feminist scholars have found the liberal foundations of the recovery project troubling. And so they've incorporated post-structuralist insights into, into public address study in a variety of ways. Most prominently, as many of you know, I'm sure Judith Butler's work on gender performativity has encouraged feminist rhetorical scholars to rethink our implicit commitment to the stability of gender itself, to the idea that gender is something possessed by rhetors and reflected in rhetorical practice rather than something that's constituted by rhetorical practice. The result is a broad recovery project that shifted from an instrumental to a constitutive focus, from measuring the efficacy of rhetoric as a response to specific situations, to elucidating how various discourses have enabled the creation of diverse subject positions for women involved in feminist activism. Generally, this recent work recognizes gender as a rhetorical process. That is, that is something that is always ongoing and that can't be limited to one side of a culturally maintained female, male, or masculine feminine binary. Movement away from an agent-centered conception of women's public address and toward a post-structuralist understanding of the constitution of gender through public discourse has been accompanied by a shift to non-oratorical and often collective forms of discourse, which has creatively expanded scholars' notions of what counts as public address. But despite these innovations, feminist research in historical public address primarily has been limited to the constitution and functions of gender in discourses related to women's activism. These discourses were, more often than not, produced by women themselves. One of the things that I do in this chapter that was spurred by um, Mike and Sean's um, plan, I should say, for, for what, what this um, volume is supposed to do, is to talk about a couple of areas where I think feminist public address work could use some could use some additional work, could use some additional thinking. And the two areas that I identify in this chapter are work on masculinity and work on visual rhetoric. So um, by talking about the ways that this, the recovery project, and in fact lots of work following the recovery project, has tended to focus on women rhetors and activities around women's activism, one of the problems that I point to is that we have in many ways left the study of masculinity sort of out there undone, particularly in terms of historical public address. And I think that this is a tremendous problem because just as the notion, cultural notions of femininity are very important to our understanding, to our study of feminism and public address, because of course we take it as a given that cultural um, cultural gender expectations are incredibly important in how women created this discourse and in how people received it. The same thing is true for masculinity and men's discourse. That is, you know, it's a central part of the rhetorical situation that powerful, often white male rhetors, um, the situations in which they've operated over the past, you know, two, three centuries, has been that their masculinity is always, in fact, at work and is always at play in those situations, but we, in fact, don't talk about that very much in our scholarship, and that's some work that I think feminist public address scholars could turn their attention to. The second area that I talk about is, in fact, the study of visual rhetoric. And... It is the case that we've been doing um, some, re uh, some really good work, feminist public address scholars have been doing some really good work with, um, with mass-mediated discourse, and this sort of exemplifies the second kind of, the second way that we talk about feminism that I mentioned at the outset, that is, feminism as a theory, methodology, or critical perspective that informs our work. And feminist public address work in this category um, varies widely, but it generally asks some variation of this implicit question. How does gender ideology function in this discourse, and whose interest does it serve? And in some cases, that focus is prompted by the gender of the rhetor, while in others, it is linked to the ideological constitution of gender in rhetorical texts, particularly, as I say, mass-mediated ones. And in this sense, we've been participating in trends in public address scholarship as a whole, where the incorporation of post-structuralist theory and attention to mass media have been important developments. For example, as I mentioned a moment ago, public address scholars' recent interest in visual rhetoric, generally photographs or, as Kara says, images, as an overlooked form of public address, is one to which feminist scholars have a lot to contribute. We're particularly well positioned as critics of visual public discourse given the primacy of visual rhetorics in the constitution of gender identity. Mediated visual discourses should continue to be a rich area of study for feminist scholars, particularly because mass media are such powerful carriers of gendered ideologies. So what I do at the, in the latter part of the chapter is actually offer a case study looking at television news discourse from 1970, bringing together several, um, several of the facets that I talk about in the chapter, that is the study of a movement, the study of a movement through images, and the ways that mass media carries ideology. And finally, I guess what I'd like to note that's been really interesting to me about working with this project is that sense that we've come to a point where feminist work in public address in this field has a real history. 
Um, and it certainly is work that was initially spurred by the second wave itself, that is, one of, as, as the second wave affected lots of areas in the academy and spurred people to do feminist work in all kinds of ways. But we have actually gotten to a point where we can look back and talk about the ways that this work has developed. And I think that it's a really vibrant area of scholarship. And in addition, of course, to producing work, what it's done is produce generations of feminist scholars. Um, because I was on, I've already been on a couple of panels this weekend which have taken as you know one of their charges to talk about feminist scholars, their relationship to other feminist scholars, and I've sort of recognized that we have probably three generations now, if you began this work with Carlin Kors Campbell's career, um, we have three generations of feminist scholars now working on these issues, and um, it's a really, it's a gratifying thing. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed about working on this project is the opportunity to construct at least one version of that history. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, next, we're going to move to um, a paper presented by James Jasinski from the University of Puget Sound. It's co-authored with Jennifer Machia from Texas a and University, and they're going to talk about analyzing constitutive rhetorics, the, re the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, and the principles of 98. Thanks. For a number of years, I've been interested in the constitutive character of constitutional discourse. In 1998, uh, I published a chapter in a collection that Kathy Turner edited called Doing Rhetorical History, where I tried to sketch a way that public address scholars might proceed with uh, this project. And I think as typically the case with much of our work, I think I did some things well and other things poorly. So I was pleased when Sean and Mike approached me a while ago and asked if I might be interested in taking on this project for the handbook. As is typically the case, uh, you, you talk to your colleagues and friends about your ideas, and so at the Vanderbilt Public Address Conference, when we were doing the informal sessions in the bar in the evening, Jen and I were talking about our work, and it just became clear to me that it would be really, really useful if we collaborated on this project together, and, and that's sort of how it was born. Uh, what I'll do is briefly talk a little bit about sort of the kind of conceptual uh, focus we try to articulate in the chapter, and then Jen will talk more about the case study uh, proper. What we do in the opening section of the chapter is review some of the more recent work on constitutive rhetoric, uh, Vanessa Beasley, Natra Cordova, Dexter Gordon, and what we can see in this work is that it continues Maurice Charlon's focus on looking at identity constitution. Now, without denying the importance of identity, what Jen and I try to do is to suggest that we need to look at a kind of a broader agenda for constitutive inquiry so that we think about values, norms, practices, institutions as things that are in fact constituted. And when we talk about constitutional discourse, we're clearly talking about the constitution of not simply a text, but as uh, uh, the Greek term politia suggests, you know, a whole way of life, practices, behaviors, beliefs, and all of that. And so the first point we try to make in the chapter is, is to push for this more expanded agenda that looks beyond identity. Um, the second thing that we try to do in the chapter is to distinguish between two different trajectories of constitutive inquiry. Um, scholars that have been focusing on the issue of identity oftentimes work uh, in, in, in different theoretical registers. So for some people it's textual interpolation and for others it's textual invitation. But what we see as a common thread in all of this work is what we refer to as an internal trajectory, where what the critic does is to examine textual interiors, especially narratives, to uncover constitutive potential. And, and we certainly think that that's important work, but what we try to do is to suggest that it be coupled with, atten with attention to what we call an exterior trajectory, which focuses on, importantly, reception, circulation, and articulation. We were both particularly inspired by a comment that Kara and her grad student, uh, ji Kang, made in their QJS essay of how many years ago? four years ago, when they talked about circulation as a constitutive process. 
And so what we're trying to do is to suggest ways that critics attend to uh, the reception, the circulation, and then the re-articulation of particular arguments, images, narratives, tropes over time. So what we try then to do in, in the case study is we focus on a pivotal instance of American constitutional discourse, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. These are texts that were drafted by Madison and Jefferson and then refined by the various legislatures. Um, oftentimes they are referred to generally as the principles of 98. And so what our case study then does is to try to perform or illustrate both an interior reading uh, of these documents as well as trying to uh, trace their uh, reception, circulation, and uh, articulation. So we're trying to combine both the internal trajectory and the external trajectory. Uh, one final point, and then I'll turn it over to Jen, and that is one of the things that we try to suggest in the chapter is that for practical purposes, critics often have to focus on a particular constitutive rhetoric, but we think it's important that critics understand that these rhetorics don't exist in a vacuum, that there's always ongoing competition among constitutive rhetorics. And, I, and, and so I think the title of the chapter does emphasize the plurality and the multiplicity so that while we're focusing on one particular particular uh, strand of constitutional discourse, in order to understand it, we always have to be aware of the other constitutive rhetorics with, with which it is always competing. Uh, so we summarized the reception, circulation, um, et cetera, idea, the external idea, as the text constitutive legacy. Um, which we think is a term that really helps to sort of focus on the fact that as Kara mentioned, um, that texts circulate. And when they do, they do so and they leave a trace. And so it, it can be something, um, I think, very interesting just to be able to, to trace out not only how it informs other discourses, but how those are then contested and reused and repurposed over time for different situations. Um, it turns out that tracing a text's constitutive legacy is not an easy task. Um, this chapter was, uh, I think, three times longer than it was supposed to be at one point, <laughs> and um, went through many, many, many drafts and revisions. And so um, what JJ thought would be good for us to do is to sort of give the long view of the constitutive legacy and then to sort of signal where we actually cut down the, the legacy analysis to uh, fit the constraints of just a chapter and not a book. <laughs> um, but so we're, <laughs> we're really uh, well aware of the fact that tracing out the legacy, especially of a text that is as important as the, the principles of 98 are, um, is not easy work um, at all. <laughs> not, a, not at all. So what we're suggesting is hard. We, we recognize that. But so, um, as JJ said, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions written um, to protest the Alien and Sedition Acts, complete failure. Right. Um, nobody else, no other state agreed with them um, as in principle. Right. So they, they, they drafted these things, sent them to the other legislatures and said, join us. And everyone said, no, <laughs> <laughs> and you're crazy and maybe that's illegal. Um, it did result, though, in Thomas Jefferson's election in the Republican Revolution of 1800. Um, so then they sort of disappear, right? Because the Alien Sedition Acts have a sunset provision, so they disappear when Jefferson's elected. Um, but then they resurface in an interesting way, in an interesting place in time, which is the Hartford Convention, um, now run by Federalists in 1815. And um, so the Hartford Convention kills the Federalist Party, right? So they invoke, again, these principles of 98. We have states' rights. We have the ability to you know, nullify or make void in our state federal law. Um, <laughs> and they do it against now Jefferson and Madison, right? Ironically, like the people who wrote the things in the first place. Um, and, and in protest of the War of 1812, which isn't going very well. And, um, and, and it just, it destroys the party, right? So the Republican press has a field day. Um, this is another one of those iconic things. They call them the blue lights, which, if you don't know what that means, it's a great story in early American political discourse, but uh, traitors, basically. 
um, and and they, they're trying to start a new monarchy, and right. So it literally does destroy the Federalist Party. They never run another presidential candidate after that in any successful way. Um, and so it's an interesting tension to see how these principles are invoked by the party that was once attacked with them, right, against the authors who originally wrote them. So it's a very interesting moment, which we don't get to talk about in the chapter because we have to cut. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what we do focus on in the chapter is the next interesting moment where these things are invoked, which is in the nullification crisis um, of 1828. And so this is the tariff of abominations. Um, the North is trying to, uh, you know, tax the South in a way that the South doesn't like. Everybody protests, but it gets passed anyway. It's really a really huge part of the 1828 election campaign, um, even though John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson were both in favor of it, um, despite what Democrats might have thought. Um, and, and so what happens is that South Carolina, as you well know, invokes again the principles of 98 to try to nullify um, the tariff of abomination. Um, and so this is the part that we actually spend some time with in the chapter, and that's um, another interesting moment where now you have um, James Madison, who's an elder statesman, and he's saying, well, you can't use my principles of 98 in this nullification crisis, and they're saying, yes, we can, because we know the principles of 98 better than you do, um, right? And so, again, you have this contest contestation over um, invoking this thing that, you know, adds to the drama of the controversy itself um, in some important ways. Um, and so then, if we were to continue to study the legacy <laughs> of, of the principles of 98, which we get to do in the chapter, um, we would then focus on what happens when they get invoked to lead up to the Civil War, right? So the South justifies secession by um, invoking the principles of 98. Um, and then we would trace them out through the 20th century. Um, and we see lots of moments and places where these things um, come up again and again and again, most notably in reaction to Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and finally, right, you can still find the principles of 28 or 98, wow, in the 21st century. So when Texas wants to secede from the Union and has their tea parties um, over the summer, or when Vermont wants to secede from the Union, they're also invoking the principles of 98. Um, and JJ said that he did a search on this and got 18 million hits or something like that on the Google. Yeah, look up sovereignty, <laughs> re sovereignty resolutions, and you'll get uh, about 18 million Google hits. And check out the Tenth Amendment Center, which prominently features on the opening uh, page of their website uh, a quotation from a scholar invoking Jefferson, Madison, and the principles of 98. Right, and it's a big part of, I think, the Libertarian Party platform if they have one in any real sense. Um, but so I think we'll wrap up the legacy discussion. Again, um, I think it's, it's important to do the interior analysis um, and to focus on the identities and, and the kinds of work that's already been done on constitutive rhetoric is really important. But I think that it's also really interesting to think more broadly about context and specifically about legacy and how these things come up and circulate and are repurposed and reused and reinterpreted and, you know. Arguable. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Thank you, James and Jen. Um, finally, we have John Murphy, also from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and John's going to talk about the role of theory in public address. In 1965, Edwin Black published Rhetorical Criticism, a Study in Method. Disciplinary histories agree that Black changed the train of public address studies, but so far as I know, only Stephen Lucas recovered this aspect of Black's legacy. In addition to being attuned to growing discontent among scholars of rhetoric, rhetorical criticism coincided with the emancipatory impulse of much social, political, and academic discourse in the 1960s. Lucas does not wish to trivialize political activists, but, he notes, what Black identified as a central defect of neo-Aristotelianism, its equivocation on the moral dimensions of rhetorical discourse, could not help but resonate with the moral underpinnings of the major protest movements of the day, particularly the quest for civil rights. 
For the most part, the anxiety produced by that emancipatory impulse has escaped the notice of those concerned with the relationship between rhetorical theory and public address. For example, the most cited quotation from the 1970 Wingspread Conference report is probably this one. Whether rhetorical criticism ought to contribute to theory seems to us beyond question. This statement has become part of a common narrative, a constitutive narrative, that that decries the subordination of public address to rhetorical theory, a story that suggests critics of the time pursued the false god of science. Yet the prospect of rhetoric reveals another reason for the emphasis on theory, fear. The book throbs with concern for the field's ability to manage the moral and political upheavals of the day. They hope that theory will allay their difficulties. Wayne Booth draws on his experiences at the University of Chicago to plead, what I would like someone to provide for me is an art of invention that would help me to deal with the fact that two of my former students, students with whom I have worked closely for a full year, are now members of the Weatherman crowd. Wayne Brockreedy notes in that volume, if contemporary rhetorical practice is experiencing a revolution, conceptual models for that practice must also be revolutionized. I recognize the intellectual impulse to transform criticism that took hold in the mid-1960s, but the examples from that book suggest another motivation. In the face of political activism, these scholars grappled with the practical and moral force of rhetorical theory and its relationship to the public address they experienced every day. Since then, concern for the moral dimensions of public address has periodically erupted into scholarly work. Yet I am not sure that we have fully grasped the effect of such debates on the relationship between public address and rhetorical theory. If the famed 1970s pluralist hiatus disrupted our intellectual foundations, it also undermined the moral consensus sustaining public address scholarship. Martin Methurst has summarized the traditional normative goals of such work. To be able to articulate a point of view, defend a proposition, attack an evil, or celebrate a set of common values was seen as one of the central ways in which the people retained their freedoms and shaped their society. The subsequent destabilization can be measured by the ways in which these words now wobble. For instance, the people is no longer a univocal term that warrants public address study. To trace the relationships between theory and text involves concomitant attention to our moral commitments. I argue that generally unexplored connection has played a major role in crafting the public address scholar's view of theory. Essays such as this one often adopt the form of a progress narrative. They point out past efficiencies and suggest a new relationship between theory and text that should shape future work and the special issues of the Western Journal of Communication dating from 1980 to 1990 to 2000 all illustrate that tendency. I try to resist that impulse, and imperfectly, I'm sure, because I suspect the old ways of integrating theory and text remain even as we chart new departures. In this essay, I explore four modes of theoretical reflection common to the practice of public address scholarship, classification, generalization, subversion, and abduction. Although the order follows roughly the historical development of these modes, each continues to influence public address study. And by modes of reflection, I mean the ways that we think about theory and the ways we entangle theory with our textual practice, how we go about using it. Um, And what I'll do in the remainder of the presentation is try to go over each of these four modes and at least offer some general thoughts about them. One of the things that surprised me the most as I did this work was the realization um, that I was not being judgmental. (laughs) Uh, As a debater, I am used to taking a position and arguing that everyone else is wrong and that I am right. Um, In this instance, um, I tended... Uh, to indicate that each one of these approaches has its strengths and limitations. And that was particularly difficult with the first two. And let me begin with the first one, classification. Since Edwin Black's demolition of neo-Aristotelianism and Wayne Brockreedy's attack on criticism that does not argue, classification has fallen into bad odor. Literally, I swear when I said to people, while one of the modes I'm looking at is classification, they shrank away from me as if I had not showered that day. 
Um, I think classification is an important mode of theoretical work, and I'm trying to remove the normative stigma that surrounds it. That is, to see what is going on in the world, to deal with anything, as Carlin Campbell and Kathleen Hall Jameson argue in their work on presidential rhetoric, to be able to deal with anything at all without classifying or typing it, without knowing what sort of thing that it is, is an enormous problem. We simply cannot do it as human beings. This is a convention presentation. We know what those norms are, and we try to follow those norms. Um, and so in the essay, I use the example then of generic discourse, particularly presidential rhetoric. Um, I would argue that the strength of this kind of class, classific, that, that, classificatory approach um, is pretty straightforward and it has political implications. That is, in an era when we see the presidency growing ever farther beyond our control as the people who are supposed to warrant presidential actions, um, what the impulse to classification does is a kind of progressive era impulse. If we can name the things in our public sphere, we can see them. And if we can see them, we can understand them. And if we can understand them, we can control them. Thus, in our criticism classes, we teach students all of the names for things. In our, my presidential rhetoric class, I teach them the genres of presidential rhetoric. They see the institutional link between discourses and the presidency. They see how these discourses develop over time. The weakness, of course, of this kind of approach is that one classifies for the sake of classifying, that we come up with the rhetoric of without any reasonable way to connect that to anything. This impulse often enters into other work, and so when you think about Ani Dow's work um, on primetime feminism, um, she becomes particularly interested in the genre of situation comedy, even though that's not her central focus. Um, feminist uh, portrayals on network television are her central focus. Obviously, then, classification um, to be useful probably exists over time, which leads me to generalization. Um, and again, when I say the word generalization, is if I've, I've dropped something that smells pretty bad into the middle of the room. We are imitating social scientists, and that is simply evil. Um, I give you Kenneth Burke. Let us try also to discover what kind of medicine this medicine man has concocted that we may know with greater accuracy exactly what to guard against if we are to forestall the concocting of a similar medicine in America. This is, of course, from the rhetoric of Hitler's battle, and Burke's assumption here is that the kinds of strategies Hitler uses can be transferred to the United States and used by brown shirt movements here. This is the kind of generalization function that I am talking about, that we tend to assume that this kind of stuff can spread. Um, drawing from Burke, as a matter of fact, the example I use here is conspiracy discourse. Um, drawing from Michael Fowle's work, from David Zarevsky's work and other, we tend to believe that conspiracy discourse can spread like an infectious disease, that it exists over time, and that we can uh, notice, for instance, that fluoride in the water will damage us as well as death panels will damage us. These kinds of conspiracy discourses exist over long periods of time. I think the political impulse of this kind of theorizing is very much about the legitimation of the discipline. And some of you have been in departments that have struggled with this. No, this kind of generalization impulse works best at a time and in a society that is, to quote Daniel Bell, the end of ideology in a technocratic kind of society. And I think it's no accident that the two critics we look to most who provide this kind of generalization are Northrop Fry and Kenneth Burke, both of whom did the majority of their work in the 1950s and the early 1960s. This is a mode of legitimation. The most famous recent critic to talk in this sort of way is Roderick Hart, um, who has argued repeatedly that the individual case study matters not. Rather, we need to look at generalized patterns of discourse, that there is an order of words to which we can begin to figure out what's going on in rhetorical discourse. If there is this kind of order of words, and it extends over time and space, then the third kind of mode of theoretical reflection we've engaged in is subversion. And happily, from this point on, I can sort of cut it short by referring to my fellow panelists. When Bonnie described Judith Butler um, and the kind of feminist work that drew from that, she is describing exactly, I think, um, the kind of mode of theoretical um, that I've labeled subversion. That is, the task is to subvert, deconstruct, undermine the order of words that has been established. Um, the idea is if you are able to undermine these cultural constructions, these performances, then you are able to change what goes on in the world. 
Um, and so if Butler argues that there are iterations of repeated performances that establish gender identities that are terrible for the prospects for women in the United States, then the task of criticism becomes to undermine those. Uh, the strength of this kind of work, I think, is that it provides a powerful vocabulary, as Butler clearly does, um, and my example in the essay is John Sloop's work, um, for stripping others of their claims, what I would call their claims, to non-textuality. That is, they indicate the textuality goes all of the way down, and thus we need to subvert, undermine that textuality. The difficulty becomes is what do we do then? Once we have established the textuality goes all of the way down, where do we stand in this world of flux? That leads me to the fourth uh, notion, which I, I draw from Jim's work, um, from his article in the Western Journal of Communication, um, the last one that dealt with that abduction or conceptual criticism. And Jim and Jennifer just provided you with a lovely example of that. That is, uh, the concept of something like constitutive rhetoric, in the essay I actually deal with prudence, but the concept of something like constitutive rhetoric in which you see them thickening the concept through work on the text. So they begin with the principles of 98 and what they just presented to you, the interior form of constitutive discourse. In order to truly understand it, however, they argue you have to look at the external form. That movement not only teaches you about the textual action of the principles of 98, but also thickens the concept of constitutive discourse. And that's precisely what abduction tries to do. So it gives you a dynamic account um, of these kinds of specific interactions, but also works to spread them over time. And you can think of concepts such as decorum, circulation, um, charisma, style, authority, all of which become these kinds of middle-level terms to guide analysis. I think the reason we've moved to this mode of reflection, again, to go back to my original thesis, um, is that at this moment of, of kind of flux, of political flux, and their analysis demonstrates this beautifully, if you go local, you can establish the rootedness of something. So these tea parties aren't just crazy people, they're Thomas Jefferson. Um, there is a place where we can live. There are strands that go back to our past. It works to make the world understandable again because there is a kind of rootedness. I think the difficulty of this, as I've argued elsewhere, is that it can get us into a kind of intellectual history um, that is absent the real material struggles of people um, at particular moments. And we need to be careful of that tendency to aestheticize or intellectualize this kind of conceptual history. So, for instance, to say that the gently to point to Professor Murcia that the principles of 98 helped to create the revolution of 1800 is to ignore what Gary Wills argues, that is, it was the slaves that created the revolution of 1800, absent the electoral votes provided by um, the institution of slavery, John Adams would have been elected in 1800. Um, and so those become the kinds of things we need to watch out for when we make these kinds of arguments. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, we have a lot of time now for questions. Any questions for the panelists? Jim? This is uh, very stimulating. Thank you all. And I want to uh, defend the two Bs from, from John. Uh, stink bomb, he left the room. Uh, the first one, Brockery, uh, it seems to me that the way I read Brockery is he doesn't say classification is a bad thing. He says it's that um, if you stop at the level of classification, then significance, which is what he adds to classification, is missing. And so that you don't just say, voila, uh, it's a cow. You have to say, why is it important that it's a cow? And when you do that, you're rising above mm -hmm. here yeah, I've, I've, I, I'm sorry if I uh, left a bad impression. Um, it's much, I think I would say, after that essay, especially those of my generation who all had to read those essays in criticism seminars, um, it, it's about the term itself falling into bad odor. And what I've consistently run into is any time I use the term, people stare at me accusingly. is that um, when you 
particular principle of rhetoric or whatever can be generalized to its possibility in all situations. And, and so I wonder if, you, if that makes any sense to you. I, I see the direction of your argument. I would defend Professor Hart and indicate that much of his work also has a kind of historical rootedness, albeit a different kind of historical rootedness. And so when he examines every president and throws them into his computer, every presidential speech, I mean, Rod's work is not the kind of work I do, but there's a, a kind of rootedness to it. Um, and, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I think in Hitler's Battle, Burke certainly does look at the specific context, but... You know, a lot of the work in that essay, like the geographical center, he is generalizing that in any society, if you have this kind of movement that says there is a geographical center, um, that that provides the movement itself with a center um, that can do things. There's a, there's a good deal of generalizing. I think we as rhetorical critics generalize without acknowledging it way too often, and that's the tendency I'm trying to say. Um, we don't. We want the cachet that comes with generalization without the responsibility that comes with generalization. So we want to be able to say, oh, you know, this creates presence in these kinds of circumstances without ever defending the process by which we got to that so that we look just as cool as social scientists but we don't have to do the kind of work that they do. Um, and that's a tendency I, I get concerned about. Vanessa? I'm really struck by... Um, um, the moment of circulation that we're in and the ways in which, you know, in some ways all of your papers deal with the question. And um, because I'm of a certain age, I'm really struck by the education uh, that I received about avoiding the effects argument. So I just want to ask for some explicit discussion about if we change the vocabulary, what's gained and what's lost. You know, as you know, whenever you make a circulation argument, somebody's going to ask you, well, aren't you really talking about effects? If you could speak to you relative to these projects or other things you've thought about, the tensions that are there, um, how we want to capture something, but we also don't want to defend, you know, a, a purely George Edwardsian, you know, effects type of argument. Um, I'd just like to hear you talk about whether or not you struggle with this, to get at a conceptual level beyond just a, a clear choice about how you're talking about impact or how you're talking about what happens. A quick response for me would be something like, you mentioned Edwards, and for me, effects in his vocabulary or his framework is, you know, attitudinal change, which we somehow have to measure. As communication scholars, I'm not, you know, I want to go Foucaultian here. I don't want to go inside someone's head. I don't think that's what we're supposed to do. I want to look at the communication practices and processes. And so if I can trace how a, a metaphor emerges at time A, and I, can, you know, and, and I can see that same metaphor then being redeployed at times B, C, D, E, that's what I think a rhetorician and a communication scholar is, is supposed to do. And, and if, if you want to call it effect, I, I guess we can, but, but, but to me, it's, 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 it's a communication effect. It's, it, it, it's mapping what's going on as opposed to trying to you know, open up someone's skull and, and peer inside, if that, if that makes some, some, some I sense. I think it's a really good question. In, in our study in particular, I think it's, um, it's, it's sort of funny, right? Like in Every time that these principles of 98 are invoked, they fail. Yet we continue, right, for 200 years or whatever, to keep using these things. Um, and so there's something, it's not a question of effect in the sense of like yes or no, black or white, but it's a, it's a different kind of question, right? It's a, it's a, how are they enabling is, is more of a different way to think about it. So it must be in some way enabling for people to keep invoking these things. It does something for them. So what does it do? And then how do people respond to what they're trying to do with that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I, you know. I could uh, add a couple of things to that. Uh, I wrote an earlier uh, kind of similarly methody uh, essay that was published in edited volume a few years ago called Defining Visual Rhetorics, and I talked there about circulation but not about reception or response. And uh, one of the things um, that got me thinking about the need to sort that out was one of the things I do in the essay that I, I didn't really talk about much here 
is suggest that the mere fact of circulation, uh, literally that something moves or that we can trace it in various moments or stopping points over time, uh, may be an indicator of significance uh, in certain contexts, but it is not, it does not, by itself it may not necessarily tell us a lot about response or reception. So, I mean, there's a lot of different terms that are at work here in this question, which is a big question. So I just, while Jim was talking, I just listed several of them. We have circulation, we have response, we have reception. I'm interested in viewership, effects, impact. And all, a lot, several of these words, especially impact and effects, are really trigger words, you know, in, in the way that you ask in your question. And I think it's worth just pushing ourselves, and especially the students we work with, to make as explicit a set of claims about any one of those things that they can. So for example, I will, students will often say to me, uh, or they'll have a project where they'll say, well, this, uh, this circulates everywhere, so that means it's really effective. Well, maybe it just circulates everywhere because lots of things circulate everywhere, especially now, right? So pulling back a little bit interpretively and being careful in, in the way that John was suggesting about uh, how much we overstep uh, our our claims about uh, whatever we want to call the effects of discourse. Uh, I think that's really important. In, in the volume, Mary Stuckey writes a chapter on instrumentality as well. So um, the example she uses is, is Jimmy Carter's discussion of human rights and how he wasn't necessarily successful in the immediate sense of the term, but that he put that on the nation's agenda so that that successive presidents were expected to address those issues and members of Congress and that she would argue is a more instrumental understanding of effect. My last question yeah. that talks about yeah. uh, Well, of course, this is a tortured issue for, for feminist scholarship because for a long time, the uh, argument was made that you know, we don't study women's discourse because women's discourse doesn't matter. And because women haven't been president, and so they haven't had the kind of authority to make their words matter, and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, railing against the effects criterion was a central issue for the beginnings of research, particularly into the, into the first wave. And, you know, the first wave is really interesting, so I'll just use that as an example, because um, we have, there's, there's lots of now sort of semi-canonical speeches from the first wave that did not have what we would think of, you know, what would qualify as effects for us. But it's, and, and it's a very long movement. It takes a long time. It takes 72 years, you know, from the moment suffrage is mentioned to the, to the moment that the 19th Amendment is ratified. And so that gives you a sense that obviously effects were not immediate. Um, and, and we also know, you know, that the end stages of, of what became the guiding goal for the first wave, that the end stages of, of the process of getting women the right to vote were, abs- were so much about, you know, bes- behind the scenes work and, and politicking and all this. And so, and in fact, there's almost, there are no, in fact, major sort of canonical, I mean, they've not, we've not yet come up with some piece of discourse from, say, between like 1910 and 1920 that we all want to study um, in the, because it's all, you know, because Carrie Chapman Cast is not very interesting. And, um, and so, I mean, she is in some ways, but, you know, in a, in a rhetorical way, not so interesting. Um, and so I really hold very strongly to, you know, a, a sort of famous line of Carlin Campbell's, which is, you know, we, this discourse is really interesting because, in fact, the obstacles they faced were so tremendous, right? And so what we study is the creativity of this discourse, um, and we can make a really good case for that. And, you know, my position is I'm... I'm completely uninterested in effects, I say, most of the time. But, you know, I also have to say, if you look at the later feminist work, we, you know, which would include some of my stuff, particularly media stuff, I've never worked on a piece of media that wasn't, you know, widely distributed, that didn't get a lot of, that didn't have a lot of at least measurable discursive impact, right? Like, I study, I stu- have studied television shows, and I only study television shows that, like, get a lot of play, in the public sphere, right, that people talk about and that are written about in, you know, all kinds of secondary media. And so there's an assumption that it's reasonable to study it because obviously it's having some kind of effect. I'm not measuring it, but we know lots of people are watching it. We know lots of people are talking about it. And therefore, that makes it appropriate for me to make some arguments about it. So, you know, there's this sort of effects, an implicit assumption about something's effectivity at work there. Um, But, um, you know, I, I actually... The kinds of things that we probably 
could measure, um, or the kinds of things that we might try to measure, um, tracing you know out from the impact of discourse are, are uninteresting to me. I, I should say, and um, because I don't think that we ever really. The way I put this in the past is that you know when I make an argument about a piece of discourse, it's basically an argument that says, "See it this way, see it this way, and see how interesting it is if you see it this way." Right? Not that anybody necessarily does see it that way. Although, of course, it's possible because if I can make that argument, that it's possible to see it that way. Um, and and you know, and so that's that's pretty much the position I take. But I, I think this is a great question because, and I could go on, you know, about this at some length. The ways that the issue of effects, you know, has you know, sort of continues to torture feminist work of a lot of varieties because it doesn't have the same opportunities as, you know, like large scale, you know, it's like presidential discourse, right, for um, measurement. Other questions? Okay. Um, I just, it seems to me everyone is talking about uh, something that we could also term the instability of what we're studying the, uh, or and how it vacillates through time and space, how it changes. And in terms of both Kara's and Bonnie's work, and I've been thinking of examples of um, visual topi, especially as it concerns feminism or anti-feminism, so that, here's just one example. Um, in the first wave, the anti-suffrage uh, dis visual discourse was often in the, uh, frame, in the form of cartoons. And postcards, right? And postcards. Yeah. And one of the most famous cartoons, I'm sure we've all seen it, is a, um, a woman going off with a briefcase and, while a man sits with two babies, twins. So both of those things really became uh, our topi in that in that era. The the man with the baby becomes a sign of his threatened masculinity, and the briefcase becomes a sign of her um, corrupted femininity. Right. When we go to the second wave, the briefcase reemerges in commercials yeah. as a sign of women's liberation. So we have all these women marching off to the briefcase. So the, the, the icon is totally unstable. And obviously in your work, it's, it's radically unstable, to use a, a phrase from a panel this morning. So I'm just wondering how you think about that, how you think about the stability of what you're studying, of what you're Are, looking at. Okay, okay. You can do that because this is I'm gonna, a visual question. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to take it maybe in a little bit of a different direction, um, which is uh, the stability within the instability. So that's that's the trick of the topoi, right? Mm -hmm. So the the icon of the suitcase and what it comes to mean over time. Um, uh, the other part of the question, and this really relates a little bit to the earlier question that Vanessa asked about circulation, and that is appropriation. So uh, a lot of uh, really interesting work uh, has been done and is being done on appropriation, especially in the visual context. And it's really, really easy to get students to see, to learn about Topoi, for example, if you show them lots of visual appropriations. So for example, uh, I have a student who's published a nice essay on uh, appropriations of the iPod silhouette ad. And when I say that, you all know exactly what I mean. And you can imagine all the kinds of appropriations. Uh, the one I show to my students is one that is the outline of Homer Simpson. And Homer Simpson, instead of the iPod in his hand, has a donut. But Homer Simpson is in silhouette. So they all get it. But then I say, well, OK, so what is this? Oh, it's Homer Simpson. Well, how do you know it's Homer Simpson? Well, it's just Homer Simpson, right? So in other words, there's the kind of immediate connection. And then there's that kind of larger, whatever you want to call it, social knowledge or moment of recognition of this other icon, which then gets... So all of this is to say that I think the trick is to think about the stability within the instability. And, and this idea of legacy, I think, is, um, is really interesting. Uh, and I like that term because it gets at the idea of length and over time. Uh, and in some ways, this links up to the idea of... Uh, uh, the, Vanessa's question about 
impact or effects. Mm -hmm. But do you, to get, the question in the the minor sense is to get the suitcase, you know, of the businesswoman with her bow tie in the early 1980s, do you need to know there was another suitcase? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Or is this something we recognize uh, later? And I think sometimes we we think that um, an argument has a particular political valence that it's, it, it's a conservative argument. And so the fact that, by and large, the principles of 98 have been rearticulated on behalf of conservative causes sometimes tricks us into thinking, well, it's a conservative argument. But there are countless examples. Uh, in the 1850s, there's a case in Wisconsin where the Wisconsin courts are arguing exactly like Calhoun, but they're arguing in a way that is decidedly anti-slavery. They eventually, I mean, the Supreme Court eventually rejects the argument, but, but they're trying to deploy the same kinds of arguments on behalf of freedom, on behalf of escaped slaves. So the kind of argument doesn't have a clear political valence. It does depend on how it's articulated and reinserted into new and different situations. I'm, the, the one thing I would like to s- add to that is one of the paradoxes, I think, of post-structuralist work in our field is that on the one hand, they argue discourse is radically unstable because there's no foundation, a la Richard Rorty or Michael Foucault or others, but also a la Foucault on the other hand, discourse is is extraordinarily material, it's powerful, it controls our actions, it becomes thick and and enormously stable and constructs all of these roles in ways that, you know, become very, the trajectory of Judith Butler is an indication of that. It's very difficult to get out of. So, radically unstable, I think, is used in a very specific kind of sense. Um, Much of what else goes on is stable, it just isn't foundational. There's historical baggage that goes along. Yes. Well, and I actually think that the, the suitcase is a good example if we think about the, the image that popped into my mind was the baby boom movie in the 80s where you have Kathleen, I think it's Kathleen Turner. Uh, oh, it's Diane Keaton. Yeah. Diane yeah. Keaton. The baby in one hand and it's in the briefcase in the other and she's bumbling around and so you have that almost almost coming full circle back to that image from the suffragists where then it's used as a warning for the feminist who wants to have it all where you have the woman who you know, the baby ball is falling out of the briefcase, and she can't obviously have the career and be a mom, and she chooses to be a mom instead. And so, I mean, I think in, in actuality, there is some real, I mean, not stability, but like, you know, Carol was saying, some stability in that instability as that image gets recirculated and reiterated in different contexts in relation to feminism, depending on, you know, the historical... You know, time... Images. Time did one of those issues about the state of feminism in the early 90s, I think in like 93, 94, um, and it had you know, those amazing of Ellie McBeal. No, that's, that's a later one. That's 98. Actually, this one's earlier, and it's something like, it doesn't actually have the word feminism on the cover, but it's something like, you know, women, what about women or something? <laughs> uh, anyway. What is um, with that? Uh, <laughs> I, had to, I had to work with it when I was writing Prime Time Feminism, you know, way back. And, um, and what's interesting is exactly what you're talking about. It has a wooden figure of a woman holding a briefcase. And it's this really, it's really creepy because, you know, she's like this static, frozen, like, wooden thing, you know. But she is, in fact, in a little business suit and she's carrying a briefcase. <laughs> so I, I, I agree that's a really... Um, that is redeployed all the time. I, I just want to say something about like the ultimately unstable. It's not even a visual referent. Um, some of the work I'm doing now is so inter- there's so it's so interesting to me because of the stability of bra burning as a reference for the second wave. There is no visual for this because of course it didn't happen, you know. So, but people talk about it all the time. It gets it gets redeployed over and over and over. And um, so a reference to something that didn't happen, and there never really, there's like almost, I've, I've seen one image of it in like, I'm not kidding, an issue of Rat or something from 1970. There is actually like somebody holding a flaming bra. But, but you know, that's a pretty obscure place. That's a pretty obscure <laughs> thing, and it's not like that had a lot of circulation. But people continue to talk about bra burning, and it continues to carry a fairly stable set of associations. And um, it's, it's a fascinating thing to think about. Okay, we have time for one more. Just very quickly, um, Emily Berg, I'm a graduate student at Minnesota studying with Carla Campbell, and as a student dangerously approaching my comprehensive exam, um, I've been... Never get that far. (laughs) Stop now. (laughs) Several times, why do rhetorical history? I'm a very historically minded person, and I was wondering if each of you could just very quickly maybe answer the question on why, why do these types of studies matter? I have my own ideas, but I'd like to hear what some of you think. And when you say rhetorical history,
histories, do you mean In terms single? of why study historical texts? Why, why do all these interesting things that we discover about the creativity surrounding the text or, or the culture around the text, why does that matter? Why do studies, why should studies like this be written more read? Well, you know, from a feminist point of view, we should do this stuff because we're really tired of reinventing the wheel, you know? I mean, that's it. That's my answer. Um, because it, when, when the work that you do, which is true in, in this case, right, for this project, when the work that you do has a political motive and, and you're hopeful has a political function, you know, part of what we do by studying the past is, you know, take things from it for, because um, it helps us understand the present, because, you know, every time, because women are continually stymied by the fact that we don't know our history and so we remake mistakes, right, or we don't use resources from our history that could be used, you know, in our present situation, blah, blah, blah. So in that sense, I would say, my answer would be because there's actually, you know, a political point to studying the past. I, I'm sort of on the flip side of your situation, right? So I just had to do last year the whole tenure packet thing and reflect back now on why I chose to be a rhetorical historian. Um, and I think that my answer is, is is sort of twofold, right? So one is very specific to the research question that I wanted to ask, which was um, why are citizens apathetic today, right? Why don't people participate? Well. To be honest, if you really want to answer that question, you have to go back through time um, and, and, for my work, specifically focus on the revolution and the founding um, and the sort of 1820s and 30s to figure out really what's going on today. Like, and so there's, there's a sense in which that's, that's crucial, right, just to answer the question itself. Um, but then there's another way in which, as a as a discipline, and what I think we can contribute to the history of ideas is that we are historians of public discourse. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a way in which um, there's a need for that in the history of ideas. Um, there are historians, obviously, <laughs> but they don't focus on public discourse in the way that we do. They use public discourse to talk about other things, but they don't actually do the work that we can do. I think we are beyond time, so we yeah. should close. But thank you very much to the panelists.